Good morning. Welcome to worship this second Sunday after Pentecost. We extend a special welcome to our visitors today, and we thank you for being here with us. We also want to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us online today. Uh, one note about our service. I've said this a million times, and I'll say it another million times probably. Every time you walk in this building, we want you to feel safe, and we want you to feel loved. That being said, we've had an outbreak of some of our members have come down with COVID. Um, not necessarily here. We had one family who remembers here were worshiping somewhere else last week, and they all came down with it. And we've had a few here. So for the next couple of weeks or until further notice, when we do the sharing of the peace, we ask you to just stay at your place and, and greet one another without contact. Uh, like I said, we want everybody to be safe and healthy. I had a couple of phone calls this week, and I shared their concerns. Uh, so we'll just do that until further notice. Uh, so we can share God's peace uh, safely. Let's take a moment now and quiet our hearts and our minds and turn our attention to the Lord that we come to worship this day. Would you turn to page two in your bulletin and stand as you're able for the confession? Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of manna, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. Drawn to Christ and seeking God's abundance, let us confess our sin. God, our provider, help us. Beloved children of God, in Jesus, the manna from heaven, you are fed and nourished. By Jesus, the worker of miracles, there is always more than enough. Through Jesus, the bread of life, you are shown God's mercy. You are forgiven and loved into abundant life. Amen. Our gathering hymn is hymn number 532, Gather Us In. Hymn number 532.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Our hymn of praise, glory to God, is found on page 148 in the front of your hymnal. Page 148 in the front of your hymnal. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to God's people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, worship you, we give you thanks. In the glory of God, amen. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, throughout time, you see the oppressed, the other sick. You may be seated as we hear God's holy word for this day. I need you to talk into the microphone a little bit. You shall not do any work.
Thanks be to God. Our gospel acclamation, Halle, Halle, Hallelujah, is printed in your bulletin. Would you stand as you're able? Here now the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 2, verse 23, through chapter 3, verse 6. Glory to you, O Lord. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did? When he and his companions were hungry and in need of food, he entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at the hardness of their hearts. And he said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out immediately and considered, conspired with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. As I begin my sermon this morning, I want us to look at an image that was just read that he, the man stretched out his hand and it was restored. He stretched out his hand and it was restored. What happened when Jesus stretched out his hands on a cross? We were all restored, right? Right. Grace, peace, and mercy be to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, way back when the children of Israel had completed their long and arduous journey from Egypt to the Promised Land, Moses gathered them together to review the principles of faith and life that God had given him when he went up on Mount Sinai to receive the law. Moses concluded his presentation with these words. Be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you, so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. These were some good words to remind the Israelites as they began their new life in the promised land. And they are a good reminder for us as we begin each day anew in God's loving grace. Be careful to do what the Lord your God has commanded you. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper. Of course, we know what laws Came, Moses came down from Mount Sinai with, right? 
the Ten Commandments. Very good, Dexter, and I didn't even coach him today. Everybody remembers the Ten Commandments, right? Okay, we're going to start with Dexter, and we're going to go around the room and recite all Ten Commandments. I'm just kidding. In Deuteronomy, our first reading that Vani read for us, one of the commandments was lifted up. It said, observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But the seventh day is the day, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. Observe the Sabbath and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your ox or your donkey or any of your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns, so that your male and female servants may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt, and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand, and there's that image again, and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. The Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Does anyone remember that commandment, what, not, what commandment that is? Four. Well, you might have heard that earlier today, didn't you? They were waiting for me to ask that question again. What does it mean to you? How do you honor the Sabbath by keeping it holy? How do you honor the Sabbath by keeping it holy? This is something for us to think about and to pray about, not just today, but in the days ahead. There was a time when we lived in a society that did a much better job at enabling us and encouraging us to honor the Sabbath. How many of you remember when businesses were closed on Sundays to allow people to honor the Sabbath? In my cynical thoughts, I suggest that that is when God was more important to society than money was. But for many people, and I think for our society in general, that does not seem to be the case anymore. But that's a sermon for another day. Let me tell you about Mark and why Mark is not able to honor the Sabbath the way he likes to or would want to. Mark went into his boss's office and said, Sir, I'll be honest with you. I know the economy isn't great, but I've got three companies after me, and I'm asking respectfully for a raise. After a few moments of thought, Mark's boss nodded approvingly and said, yes, you've earned a 5% raise for your good work. And if I may, what three companies are after you? Mark looked sheepishly before he answered, the electric company, the water company, and the gas company. We live in a world with constantly rising expenses. We work long and hard to pay our bills, to keep a roof over our heads and food on the table. A study conducted at Gettysburg College concluded that the average person spends more than 90,000 90, hours working just to be able to live a reasonably good life. Over 90,000 hours working. That translates to 2,080 hours working a year for those who have a 40-hour work week. In addition to that, we spend another 220 hours working around the house and in the yard at the end of the day or on our weekends. The reality is we work a lot. We work a lot to get by. Even many retired folks find themselves working one or even two part-time jobs just to try to stay ahead or at least keep up with inflation. Some of our retired folks who don't work also find themselves very busy with volunteer work or meeting other obligations. <coughs> Excuse me. I've heard from more than one retired person that they don't know how they ever had time to work with as busy as they are. I have to wonder, though, what does all of this work and all of our busyness do to us physically? 
Healthline suggests that when we work too much, some are tempted to drink too much to calm down at the end of the day. There's also, they also share a concern that too much work translates to poor quality work, which often leads to terminations. Also, the, the lack of sufficient rest, be it from working a job or trying to fulfill your obligations, can cause feelings of depression an unhealthy strain on our hearts, numerous aches and pains, and even strains on our interactions and our relationships with those that we love the most. There's an old story about a wagon train of settlers who were traveling from St. Louis to Oregon. Among those in the convoy were several Christian families. Initially, at the urging of the Christians, the wagon train observed the Sabbath day by stopping travels on that day and worshiping God. But as winter approached, with the threat of bad weather and treacherous roads through the mountains, some of the group began to panic that they, should, that they would not reach Oregon by the first snowfall. So they proposed traveling even on the Sabbath day. The Christians in that group were strongly against it. And eventually, there was a division, and there became two wagon trains traveling to Oregon. One would travel all seven days, and the other would travel six days, and then they would rest on the Sabbath, no matter what the cost or the consequences might be. The story concludes by reporting that the group which rested and observed the Sabbath day arrived to Oregon first. The people and the horses, because they were rested, we're able to travel more efficiently on the other six days. Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for humankind, not humankind for the Sabbath. We've all been there, I'm sure. We know what a physical toll it can take on us with too much work, whether it be at our jobs or fulfilling all of our obligations and commitments and not enough rest, how many of us have been there? Probably all of us, more times than we realize. We often hear about and hopefully think about the physical to toll that it takes on us, but have you ever thought about the emotional, the spiritual toll that it takes on us? The spiritual toll that it takes on us. The temptation or mistaken belief that when we work too much or when we're too busy with and we get so overwhelmed that we can just keep going. We can make it on our, on our own. We can take care of our lives. Essentially, that we can get along on our own without time and respite and care with our gracious and loving God. In these circumstances, sometimes, whether we realize it or not, we are replacing God with our foolish belief that we are in charge. Now, how many of you think you are fully in charge of your life? If you do, I have a bridge I'd like to sell you. When we do that, when we put anything in front of God, including our dependence on ourselves to keep going and pushing through and, and not taking that time to away and for respite with God, then we're breaking the first commandment. Who knows what the first commandment is? No other gods, right? Everybody remembers that, right? We shall have no other gods. When we do that, we're not hurting God. Sure, we grieve God anytime we don't put our relationship with God first. Anytime we don't take that time apart with God, grieves God. But the reality is, there is nothing. There's not a single thing that God needs from us. I invite you to think of one blessing you have, one thing that you have, that didn't come from God. The awkward silence. Every blessing, everything that we have, comes from God. God gives it to us to bless us, to nurture us, to nourish us, to strengthen us, to love us and love one another. When we don't put God first, when we fail to honor the Sabbath, we deprive ourselves. We deprive ourselves of the blessings that God has given us, the blessings of forgiveness and grace, of rest and renewal, of quiet and peace 
and comfort. All blessings that were secured for us on a cross and an empty grave. So again, that leaves us with the question that we must ask ourselves and discern. How am I honoring the Sabbath by keeping it holy? How am I honoring the Sabbath by keeping it holy? We all gathered here this morning for worship, right? We're all here to worship God, right? Through word and sacrament, through song and prayer, in community, gathered together. That's certainly honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy. Would you agree with me? Absolutely. But how do we honor the Sabbath and keep it holy when we walk out these doors, fed and nourished by God's love at table through word? How do we continue our day honoring the Sabbath, honoring God? As you think about that and as you pray about that, two other questions come to mind. First of all, are you here today to fulfill an obligation? Are you, and don't answer me out loud, please. Are you here today to fulfill an obligation or are you here today to be strengthened and cared for? Are you here today to fulfill an obligation or are you here today to be strengthened and cared for? Another way to think about that. Why do I worship? Why do I honor the Sabbath? Why do I love? Because God first loves us. And because God first honors us. God doesn't give us the Sabbath because he needs us to take that time. God gives us the Sabbath so we can have that time to strengthen our relationship, to take that respite time away from the busyness in our lives. It's for us. It's not for God. But the reality is when we set this time apart, when we honor the Sabbath, when we choose to gather for worship, God also uses our presence and our participation. God uses our offering of our time and our talents and our treasures to bless others. To bless others. I want to end with this final thought today. The Pharisees were challenging Jesus, which they did so often. They were challenging him about following the letter of the law. Because that's what they did. For them, enforcing the letter of the law was the most important thing. Even if they didn't always practice those laws themselves. Jesus told us in his scripture reading today, in our gospel lesson, he was grieved by their hardened hearts. He was grieved by their hardened hearts. Jesus reminded them, and is lifting up for us, that God's love and grace is always paramount and always supersedes the law. That God's love and grace is more important than anything and everything in this world. Amen? There was no way Jesus would let folks go hungry, even on the Sabbath. There was no way Jesus was not going to care for someone who needed his care simply because somebody would say he was breaking a law. He said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath? To save a life or to kill? Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life, or to kill. As we leave this place this morning to go out into the world to be the church, it is my prayer, first and foremost, that you will love yourself and you will care for yourself as much as our Lord loves and cares for you. And that God will give you more powerful ways to be more intentional in honoring the Sabbath and in helping others to honor the Sabbath. And that God's love and grace will always, always be a priority in your life and in the lives that you are called and empowered to bless. Amen? Amen. Our hymn is hymn number 729, The Church of Christ in Every Age. Would you stand as you're able?
Together, let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, found on page 105 in the front of your hymnals. Page 105 in the front of your hymnals. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. The peace of the Lord be with you always. 
While remaining in your place, please share a sign of peace with one another. Good to have you with us. Amen. Our worship continues as we offer our gifts and our tithes to our Lord.
Our offertory hymn is hymn number 692, We Are an Offering. Hymn number 692. Would you stand as you are able? The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection, open to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes the name. Highest. Blessed are you, O God of the universe, your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for your spirit poured out on all people. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us 
and on these gifts of bread, wine, and juice. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up to be the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. And then send us forth, burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all time and all places, with the earth and all its creatures, with the sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the children of God. Christ has set a table with more than enough for all. Come, you may be seated. For Holy Communion today, you'll be invited to come forward and pick up a plastic cup as you either stand or kneel at the rail. The bread will be placed in your hands with the promise, the body of Christ given for you. The red wine will then be poured into your cup with the assurance, the blood of Christ shed for you. We also have white grape juice if you wish not to have red wine, and we have gluten-free bread for those who require it.
Would you stand as you're able? May the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his most precious blood strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. My sisters and brothers in Christ, may the blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever. Amen. We want to share a couple of announcements before we conclude our worship service. First, you'll notice there's an insert in your bulletin. We have some summer outdoor worship, worship opportunities. And the first one is this Tuesday. Out in the parking lot, we're going to have a hymn sing beginning at 6 o'clock. We have a hymnal... Uh, a booklet made up with all the popular hymns. Ellsworth is going to play the keyboard for us, right? So he's going to play something for us as we sing. And after we sing, have our hymn sing, we're going to have a covered dish picnic. I'm going to provide some kind of protein. Fellowship's going to provide all the tableware. We invite you to bring either a side dish or a dessert to share. Not necessary, but if you'd like to. Also, you want to bring a bag chair or a beach chair to sit in and bring your own beverages. Now, you are allowed to have beer and wine on the property, but we're not allowed any hard alcohol. And then the third Tuesdays of the month, we'll be having worship on the beach right behind the Ashore, the former Clarion. You can park here, walk right across the street. Again, those will be followed by a covered dish picnic. I'll provide the protein. Fellowship will provide the tableware. You're invited to bring a side dish or a dessert to share. And over there, you'll need to bring your own chair and your own beverages. Now, on the beach, we're not allowed to have any glass, and you're not allowed to have any alcohol. Suzanne, you go first this time. Right-hand side. Bulletin board's on the right-hand side. And we're carpooling to that, correct? Great. And Linda. And the sign-up sheet for that is out by the door on the left. <laughs> Two other things I want to share with you. Um, this coming Friday and Saturday is our annual Synod Assembly. And I and Evan and Keith Hall and Linda and Paul Gray will be representing you all at the Synod Assembly. For those of you not aware of the Synod Assembly, it's when the churches, representatives from all the churches in our Synod, which our Synod is all of Delaware and all of Maryland except for one church, the whole way on the other side in Cumberland, um, and we get together, we have representatives from all the churches, hopefully. We make decisions, and we have conversations, and we share what's going on in the Synod. And we also make recommendations and decisions for the larger church. 
So I ask that you hold us all in prayer as we represent you all for the Synod Assembly this Friday and Saturday. Uh, my last announcement is I hope you would all join us in the CLC after worship for coffee and refreshments and fellowship. I invite you to consult your bulletin and newsletter to see what else is happening in the life of this congregation and in this community. But for now, our sending song, hymn number 400, God of Tempest, God of Whirlwind, hymn number 400. <laughs>